Good afternoon, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books, and Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We're really excited to be here today with our friends from Auburn Avenue Research Library. They will be dropping extra information in the chat for all of us to enhance our learning, um, especially for this book. I think it's a really wonderful collaboration and opportunity for us to add more info into our arsenal about these African icons who we are celebrating today. So we're joined today by Tracy Baptiste, who is the author of African Icons, 10 People Who Shaped History. Tracy lived in Trinidad until she was 15. She grew up on Jumbi stories and fairy tales and is the author of the Jumbi series, in addition to the New York Times bestseller, Minecraft, The Crash. She is a former teacher who works as a writer and editor. You can visit her online at tracybaptiste.com and on Twitter at Tracy Baptiste. And she's joined in conversation by Gabriel Bump. Gabriel grew up in South Shore, Chicago. His nonfiction and fiction have appeared in Slam Magazine, The Huffington Post, Springhouse Journal, and other publications. He was awarded the 2016 Deborah Slosberg Memorial Award for Fiction. He received his MFA in fiction from the University, University of Massachusetts Amherst, and he now lives in Buffalo, New York. Everywhere You Don't Belong is his first novel, which we got to celebrate last year. Time flies, right? It was last year. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's two years. In my <laughs> yeah. uh, at Kara, so if you go back into our virtual archive on our YouTube channel, Channel, you can check that out as well. So um, I want to encourage folks, if you are watching at home and want to ask a question, you can do that by dropping in the chat or in the ask a question box, and I'll be sure to um, make sure it gets seen. But um, welcome to you both. Thank you so much for being with us. It is, of course, African American History Month, um, and this book is not just, of course, about America. It is much, it's a global book, but um, we wanted to include it in this month as um, part of that celebration and uh, in connection with the Auburn Avenue Research Library. So glad to have you here, uh, especially for part of this month. Thank you. Yay, thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, yeah, so I'm, well, hey, Tracy, how's it going? Hi, good. Not too shabby. It's nice today. So, you know, it's it's a, it's okay here in New Jersey. <laughs> it's actually yeah, good. It's, I'm not frozen. Yeah, sun's finally shining. It's warming up uh, here, too. Uh, well, I'm so excited that we get to do this, and thanks, for, thanks, Charis, for hosting us. Uh, what an interesting, amazing book. Ah, uh, thank you so, so, so much. Um, yeah. This this book was a real pain in the behind to write. <laughs> okay, so we'll get into that. We'll get into that. We'll spend about an hour just talking about how much we're hearing about this book. Here. But uh, if you wouldn't mind, would you mind uh, reading a selection? Sure. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from the very beginning of the book. Um, so it starts out with, um, there's like a little intro, and I just wanted to show you guys this map that like it starts with. Um, the reason that I wanted to have this map right at the beginning of the book was because um, you know, like the, the, you know, like the size of Africa is distorted, which is something that, you know, we can talk about later, but um, this is the size of the United States in relative to the size of the African continent. So um, that's something I just wanted to show you. And I'm going to read from a section called the Sahara Nyons. For millennia, ancient Africans thrived on a continent of multiple landscapes. There were lush forests, ice-capped mountains, volcanic craters, grassy plains, serrated peaks, marsh, marshlands, treacherous rivers, deltas teeming with wild animals, and eventually formed over thousands of years the formidable desert, the Sahara. Without claws, horns, hooves, or tough hide, humans had to adapt quickly for their own protection and survival. They paid close attention to the land, the weather, the sky, and every creature around them from the enormous, vicious auroch, a now extinct species of wild cattle, to the tiniest tsetse fly whose bites could cause sleeping sickness and fever. They honed their hunting skills and developed ever better tools and weapons. The first bows and arrows appeared around 62,000 BCE. Following on the heels of this new hunting technology came spring traps. 
These use the same principles of tension and release as bows and arrows and could be set and left as hunters did other work. Knives advanced from whittled stone to blades that could be attached to wooden handles and were made of forged iron with razor sharp edges on one side and blunt curved edges on the other. In the earliest example of applied chemistry, Africans developed glue to assemble these tools. They learned to heat it to a precise temperature that allowed them to attach the blade to the handle without weakening either the blade or the handle. This made it possible to have tools and weapons that could be used multiple times rather than single use projectiles like wooden arrows. As their understanding of chemical compounds evolved, Africans developed a new hunting weapon, poison. These poisons were cleverly composed to fell huge ancient beasts, but have no ill effects on the people who would eat the meat after. Africans used the available raw materials they had to their advantage, and they used them with flair. When hunters set out, they left behind shelters made of natural materials outfitted with soft cloth bedding stuffed with insect repelling plants. Their walls were covered in artistic carvings and pigmented paintings. When they pursued game, bows and arrows in hand, they took along ever sturdier spears and knives covered with geometric carvings that reflected each hunter's ownership and sense of pride. Water canteens made of ostrich eggshells were delicately carved with water spouts attached for easy drinking. Beautifully whittled whistles were used to send melodic messages to fellow hunters over long distances. About 6,000 years ago, the land was beginning to change beneath Africans' feet. The Earth's tilt, which is always shifting slightly, had made enough of a move that a large portion of land in North Africa that was once thick with trees and plants began to dry out. Over the course of 5,000 years, the land went from green and moist to dry and sandy. Those in the northeast of the continent who had developed the Arabic language recognized the new landscape at once as Sahara, or desert, which gave the desert its name, Sahara. The dry, sandy landscape eventually would stretch to 3.3 million square miles, roughly the size of the United States, making it the largest hot desert in the world. The vast, waterless, intensely hot Sahara squeezed communities in northern Africa toward the coasts. The country south of the desert in what is called sub-Saharan Africa would have a different history than the countries to the north who were connected by land or a short water voyage to, the, to Europe and the Middle East. In the northern part of the continent, agricultural societies formed where the ground was wet and rich enough for planting. The first major African communities came together around a length of fertile ground to the east along the banks of the Nile River. One was Kush, the other, Egypt. With the Nile flowing through their land, the scorching Sahara to their west and rough seas to the east, the Kushites and Egyptians enjoyed abundant lives free from outside influence. Within their borders, however, there was turmoil. And that's how we get to the first of the 10 icons. Well, thanks, Tracy. Oh, thanks thank you. Yeah, and I think we'll go through some of the icons. Uh, just I'd like to hear you speak on why you chose like these 10, right? For one, for one, and then oh. what the uh, process like. But first, sure. you said why this book was a pain in the butt. Yes. So you could say a little bit more about why you decided to write this book. Um, you know, the writing this book was not actually my idea at all. It was my editor's idea. And the way it happened was that um, during the previous administration, um, so we're talking about, you know, 2016, um, you know, the first um, Black History Month, um, where the, the former president was hosting this Black History Month breakfast. And he said some just really incredibly ignorant things about um, you know, Black history and Black people and clearly did not have any real kind of grasp on what um, Black history was. And there were a lot of um, children's book writers like myself who were former teachers who wanted to take that opportunity to provide some information to teachers that they could use in their classrooms for that day. 
and everybody started posting on their websites and um, you know on social media, um, you know various facts about Black history. And the thing that I notice uh, when when people were posting, and the thing that I have always noticed when we get to Black History Month is that there is a focus on um, freed slave, the Reconstruction era, um, the civil rights movement, and the same people uh, get brought up over and over again. So I did a very quick Google search, um, you know, not exactly like the most <laughs> you know, thorough, accurate search in the world, but I came up with about six facts that were about Black people prior to enslavement, and I called a, a blog post you know, uh, Africans before slavery. And I just put up these very quick facts and it got a lot of um, attention. Um, you know, people wanting to know more about like who these people were. One of them was a prince who was enslaved and brought to the United States and um, uh, and then eventually made his way back to um, um, Africa, you know, very, very late in his life. And my editor called me up and she's like, you know, a lot of people are really interested in this. Do you want to make it into a book? And I thought, sure. How hard could that possibly be? Not knowing, you know, like how much research would be involved and how, um, how biased the research would be and how difficult it would be to find information because there were a lot of historians just did not think that um, Africa and people from the African continent were really worthy of um, being studied as historical topics. So that's why the book was incredibly difficult. It took a really long time, um, partially because I am not a skilled researcher by any stretch of the imagination. So I think things took me a lot longer because I was like so nervous the entire time about making sure that I got facts correctly, making sure I got the right facts, making sure I double check those facts. So, you know, like th that was part of it. But also there was this whole layer of, I can't find this information that I want to find, or, you know, I see like some tiny piece of information, I, I go chasing it. And I am led down this, you know, very circuitous route that leads to nothing because nobody explored this fully and so i have to drop it and then you know picking up something else and then it's riddled with bias that i then have to like parse through to get to the facts that i can then put into this book yeah. bias free um so for for all of those reasons the book was a real pain <laughs> to do i mean totally worth it because the entire time i was thinking about the fact that I would have loved to have this book as a kid growing up or or anybody really, because I was learning so many things. Um, that's really the thing that kept me going. It was the idea that there would be readers who really appreciated it. Um, otherwise, if it was just for me, I would have given up a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know it does feel like a, um, like a public service you've done for this thing. I don't, like, I, I think that is, as a young, well, as a child, I would have liked to have had this book in school, right? And you, I guess even starting at the beginning, uh, the first person that we talk about is Mimis, uh, the emperor that ended up unifying Egypt, right? And, and I feel like when I was learning ancient Egyptian history, when I was, oh, I don't know, like in elementary school, right? Like the connection wasn't made uh, between Egypt and Africa, right? Even right. though like yes. you see it. Right, like it's on, it's on the map. So I even think that uh, just being like straightforward and saying that ancient Egypt is an ancient African civilization, right? Right. And so I guess like what uh, was that a natural choice to start with ancient Egypt? I, I just wonder, like, because it does kind of progress chronologically. Uh, and yeah. Yeah. Just tell us more about why you why you chose these ten people. We can kind of go through the list too, if you want. Sure. So it was um, because I was covering, I, I definitely knew that I wanted to do pre-colonial Africa, but of yeah. course, pre-colonial Africa is, first of all, you know, like the, the very first map shows you it's a huge continent. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's this ginormous space. There is no possible way to like, you know, accurately cover all of that. And then I was also covering a wide swath of time, you know, really from prehistory all the way up into the 1500s. 
Um, so the thing that I, I started with was a timeline. Um, I just started from as far back as I could think and all the way up to, um, you know, where I thought was going to be a good place to stop um, as far as, you know, like, because, you know, colonialism, you know, like the sort of start of colonialism is a little nebulous. So, you know, I just sort of picked an ending point. And what I did was I I went to um, start researching the things that I, I really found interesting that happened. Um, so I was looking at first at the how um, empires rose and, and fell. Um, and those were things that there were a lot, there was a lot of information about, you know, empires rising and falling and how all of that happened. So the first draft really was more about space than it was about people. Um, because I, I hadn't really nailed down um, like all of the personalities yet, yet, but I had this idea of these things happening in this space and why it was some empires rose and some empires fell. And a lot of it had to do with what was happening in the land, like, you know, the finding of certain uh, minerals and, um, you know, the depletion of certain um, natural resources and, and, and things like that. And so I handed that to my editor because I was just like, I don't know, like, what I'm doing yet. And as she read through, she's like, you know, here are these people maybe we just focus in on those people and have the story then, you know, be around them. And so we did drop um, somewhere towards the end um, and uh, we switched around a couple of people, but we did decide to go chronologically at that point. And um, that, you know, so the very first figure from, you know, like way, way back was Minis. And he, you know, uh, Egypt was um, one of the first um, major societies that came out of the African continent um, and was so um, well respected and so coveted that, you know, everybody was looking towards Egypt and, and what they were doing. And I discovered that the, the, you know, the very first person who decided to unite Egypt and create what we understand of as ancient Egypt was this 25 year old young buck who was like, <laughs> I'm going to be king of all and went around like conquering all of the minor kings um, and just being like, yeah, I'm taking charge of like the whole, you know, jam. <laughs> and, well, like, and the illustrations are really good. Too. Oh can see like this. Cause I remember uh, like actually in school learning about the unified like crown. Yeah, yeah, the, and so, the whole thing was he, I mean, he was really smart. He was not just a good military leader, um, but he also was really thoughtful about the symbolism that was so important to all of the Egyptian people, regardless of how fractioned um, Egypt was at the time that he kind of started out. They all had this, um, they all you know, had the same religion and they all, all of the religion was very um, heavy on symbolism. And so he took those two crowns, the crowns of the Northern Kings and the crowns of the Southern Kings and put them together as part of um, his bid to, you know, like unify everybody and make everybody feel like they belonged to one country as opposed to having those north south divisions. So that was like really genius. But when you were learning about it at school, did you think of him as a black man? Oh, no, not not at all. Right. right. And I guess that that's the thing. Like we even, uh, well, even today, um, I think that Egypt is, isn't really considered like culturally a part of Africa. Right. It even I guess there was this the just recently I don't know if you follow soccer at all, but this past month there's uh, the African like uh, it's the African version of the World Cup I guess right. So it's yes, the, yes. The championship, which like Egypt plays in and is like dominated for a while, right? And so in like an athletic sense, you can see it as part of it, but uh, like culturally, and then even parts of uh, Northern Africa. So Hannibal is another person. Really mentioned here, and and even when I was learning about Hannibal, I didn't imagine Hannibal as a black man, uh, and 
and this well okay and this is kind of connected because what i liked about this book too is that you include the conquerors the kings uh Monte Musa, like the wealthiest man ever so you include the powerful uh but i love that Aesop is also one of the 10 people that you yeah. include. So can you tell us something about because i know that people i guess know about the the fables uh and I do remember in, in college, I had one particularly, uh, well, I don't know how, what adjective to actually use, but I, I had a professor who the first day of our African, uh, African-American history class uh, made a point and went on a rant about Aesop being a black man that nobody knows and that uh, Af uh, black culture has created all culture, all literature around right. us. So you could, I guess talk, tell us about ASAP, why you included it, right? In this, uh... Right. I, so there are a couple of people who, who, you know, who are, you know, sort of like regular people mm -hmm. in the book. Aesop yeah. is one of them. And um, Terentius is, is the other one who's a playwright. Yeah. Um, and Aesop was, you know, by our best guesses, an Ethiopian man mm -hmm. who was enslaved um, and taken to Greece. So that's also why, um, I mean, the illustration that Hillary does of Aesop, like it kills me because yeah. in all of the illustrations that I had ever seen of Aesop, yeah. I never saw this. I sort of saw this yeah. kind, of, kind of white, Grecian looking person with like curly, like, you know, like curly hair, but sort of like, you know, the, the kind of Grecian or Italian kind of curly yeah. or it's like loose waves or whatever, but she does put him in Grecian clothing. Um, you know, so he's a very Ethiopian face, mm -hmm. um, very Ethiopian skin tone, but you know, he's in, um, in Grecian clothing, which I thought was genius. I mean, uh, Hillary's illustrations are just, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, I cannot imagine this book without the illustration. Like she was so, particular and detailed about making sure that, you know, the facial types, the the skin tones and everything were, were like really matched the person like of the time period and like where they came from and when they would have lived. It's incredible. But yeah. um, the reason I wanted to include ASAP was because for exactly the reasons that, you know, we've just been talking about, like, A, I don't think that there are a lot of people who recognize ASAP as an African man. Um, and because everybody knows Aesop's fables, yeah. <laughs> you know, it has become this thing all over the world. It's, well, particularly in the English speaking world, um, it is one of those cornerstones of literature and like and really like Greek literature, what people consider to be, you know, the, the quote unquote canon. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and he yeah. here he is like right in the middle of it, um, you know, a lot of what we understand about storytelling comes from um, these stories and, and they were then adapted and distributed all over the world and, you know, softened in some <laughs> cases. Um, they, they could have been quite brutal, um, the original ones, but I thought it was like really important for, for young readers to understand uh, that their storytelling, their stories, um, are just as valuable as anybody else's because, you know, I grew up, I grew up in Trinidad mm. and we had a very uh, British um, education. And so I got a lot of European literature, but because I grew up in Trinidad, I also got a lot of Caribbean literature. So, that, you know, there were a lot of black writers that I wrote, but even then, like, I didn't know that Aesop was a black man. Um, so I had this sense of, you know, my stories mattering. Um, but when I moved to the United States, I, I realized that there were a lot of kids who did not get that. They were getting a lot of European stories and thinking that, you know, white storytelling mattered and that, you know, black storytelling or storytelling that were from other parts of the world, India, um, you know, China, Korea, you know, like other places were not as valuable. And here is a black man whose stories have you know, gone all over the world, have lasted, you know, thousands of years of, of storytelling that people still love. People are still publishing Aesop's Fables, you know, like they're still, you know, being reprinted now. And that was really, really important to me. And then when I saw Hillary's illustration of him, 
I mean, it was just breathtaking. It really took that whole idea, like everything that I was thinking to a whole new level, like seeing this dark skinned black man who is the author of all of these stories. Like it just put chills like all up and down my body. It was just incredible. Well, and it was like revered in his time too. It was like right. wildly like popular. Right? He was like, yeah, exactly. He was extremely popular in his time and then remained, remains yeah. popular. Yeah. Like who, who can say that, you know? Well, um, yeah, and it's, well, not a few no people. It's <laughs> Asaph, I guess. Can. <laughs> but then I think that, uh, like, I don't know, like, and I guess just not to harp on kind of the illustration and the importance of, it's because it's not just representation, right? It's like a, just a truthful depiction of something uh, because, like, Asaph's whitewashing was intentional. Oh, and for sure. I feel like having this intentionality about like this is what he actually looked like is important. I think that yeah. it's important to like counter balance that narrative. And also the idea of Terrence, uh, who I, I like hadn't heard of. Like, I feel like I know like most Yeah, of I didn't I had never heard of him either, but he was yeah. also like wildly influential yeah. um in his time, but also remains influential because you know, like one of his plays is still something that people I'm um, still look to and talk about. And the thing that I particularly liked about Terrence was that um, he wasn't doing the same thing that everybody else was doing. He was innovating in his time, yeah. which is a thing that we are still talking about now. Like, how do you adapt something, right? Mm -hmm. Like we talk about that all the time. And, um, you know, like we, we even talk about like, who can write what story? Like yeah. that's a big conversation that we have that we are having right now. Um, and he was somebody who was doing all of those things in his time, like taking things, remixing them, adapting them, um, changing, you know, like the form and structure of stories so that he could make them more interesting. And people were like, the hell is he doing? Oh, wait, they're children. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> Well, and, and I guess we could, like one of the innovations was like, like plays used to start out with this long uh, like monologue. Like, okay, here you've come to see this play. Here's everything that happens. Yes, it tells you. Yes, it tells you the whole story before the play starts. <laughs> and Terrence was like, "No, we're cutting that. Like, we're just going." <laughs> I just, I, I like that. Uh, well, I don't know. You're right because that is just a, a totally genre defining move and, and so the, the idea of someone having that kind of influence on uh on art you know being side by side with, with people that have influence on uh you know nation states and like geography i think is is important it was really nice to see in the book oh thanks yeah i mean i just felt like it was um you know it, it just it, it really interested me because it meant that a lot of the things that we still grapple with now as writers are things that have been conversations mm -hmm. for such a long time. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, it was a little bit more personal to me as a writer, um, including uh, Terentius because, because of that. Mm -hmm. But also there was this idea of, of letting, um, you know, like younger readers understand that their innovations are okay. Like if you yeah. wanted to take something and innovate it, that's like fine. <laughs> you can yeah. do that. You know, people have been doing it. People who look like you have been yeah. doing it. It's okay. Yeah. yeah. And then, and so I guess there's another person here that struck me. And I guess we, I'm interested to see like who your personal favorites are, who was kind of the most fun to research. Uh, but, and I don't, I'm trying, even following the pronunciation, I don't want to get this wrong. Uh, but Tin Hanan. Yes, that you got it. You nailed it. <laughs> yeah, Tin Hanan. Uh, another gorgeous illustration we can. Yeah, see this was it. the this was actually the very first illustration they showed me of oh, really? the one in the book. Yeah, yeah um, so and cool. I was like, and I saw it um, originally just as a sketch. It didn't even have color yet, yeah. and I was like in tears. Um, so yeah, Tin Hanan was uh, so many things about her. Um, were really interesting. I found that the women in the book were really quite forward thinking. Mm -hmm. And Tin Hanan for sure was was somebody who was incredibly forward thinking. 
Um, I don't know. It's, it, I mean, of course, you know, you, you, we can't know what she was thinking about um, as she headed into the desert. So she was um, from the north of Africa. She was one of the Berber people. The Berber people were nomadic and they really understood the desert. Um, they had been trading and going, uh, you know, back and forth across the desert for thousands of years. So as the desert was changing and, and expanding, the Berber people were still living on it. And so they really understood it like nobody else understood it. Um, and then it became clear that sub-Saharan Africa, so everything to the south of Africa, of, of the Sahara, had all of these great minerals and things that people really wanted to have access to. So, you know, gold, silver, um, iron, um, the iron that came out of Africa was a lot stronger than the iron that came out of Europe. Um, so it was, you know, much more coveted because, you know, it could be made into better weapons and so on. And so there had been, you know, you know, the Berber people leading other people across the Sahara for trade. Mm -hmm. And so here is this woman, and you don't really think of women in this time as being the leaders of, of things, but she decided to go into the desert, found this oasis, uh, came back uh, in the Ahagar Mountains, came back to her people um, and said, you know, let's, we're, you know, follow me into the desert and we're going to found a city here. And the city really served as a resting place, a real oasis, um, you know, for the travelers and merchants who were going through the desert um, to, you know, because it was a, a place to stop and you know, water your camels and get rest and eat and relax and not be worried about, you know, bandits like just showing up over the next dune to like kill you and take all your stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's it's one of those reasons that the the map at the beginning of the book is really important because when you think about the Sahara as being the size of the United States, imagine having to like walk through that. You know, to get to like the next yeah. place you're gonna stop, like you gotta walk through that whole thing. It's hot. There's nothing. <laughs> There's nowhere to get anything to drink. It was like really smart of her to be like, I'm gonna put a city in the middle there, so people have a place to go, a destination where they can stop and rest and like refresh and stuff before they continue on. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and that you know, it was very very forward thinking. It was after her time that the Trans-Saharan trade routes then really started to expand mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a much larger way. And there were sort of more cities popping up. Um, but, you know, she was one of the, you know, if not the first one, certainly one of the, the first ones to have done that um, mm -hmm. and made commerce possible. And that was the center of world commerce mm -hmm. at the time. Um, so she made that possible um, just by going into the desert and, and saying, OK, let's let's found this city. Well, yeah. And I mean, it was so unbelievable that people didn't believe it right. <laughs> until, they found, until they found her grave. Exactly. Like, yeah. And then they're like, oh, no, this is just um, this is just uh, a legend. Right. Yeah. Because a lot of the stories that African peoples told were oral histories. So there were the griot or the jeli who learned all of the histories and told and memorized them like literally living libraries and would tell these histories you know like on demand like you know like clicking on a link <laughs> but it's a person um you know and and they were like yeah there was this woman and people were like you know there were a lot of historians who were like no if it's not written down it's not real it's not history yeah. And then they found they found her body and they're like, oh, that was true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've been telling you, haven't we? <laughs> or even the idea that she was in, entombed in a Roman burial place, right? Because like, I think that like stopping the the time frame you cover is feels natural to me, right? Like Africa before enslavement, before we know the uh, like the modern pillage and destruction right. yeah. of it, and it's uh, and for whatever reason, I, and this might not be a totally common conception or misconception, uh, 
But Africans and Europeans were trading, engaging with each other for a really long time. We talk like ASAP being uh, a slave in Greece, right? And then like uh, it's Alexander the Great uh, venturing into like ancient Egypt, right? Like there was this uh, mutual respect, like symbiotic relationship that was thrown out of whack, I guess, right? right. Completely turned. And, uh, so it's like showing that it, there was this time possible in, in the past where uh, two different kind of cultures, various cultures were engaging in peaceful commerce, right? Like right. just yeah. exchange of ideas and stuff. Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was, that really was the big revelation for me when I was writing it. So, um, you know, one of the things that I talk about is the fact that um, there were, um, there, there was material that sort of rivaled um, Italian um, uh, wool um, mm-hmm. that, that came out of Africa. So there were, you know, there, there were a lot of sort of coveted materials that were coming out of Africa that was being used in Europe. And there were a lot of European materials that were moving down into Africa. So, for example, Venetian glass, which is something that some people still talk about, um, like Venetian glass. Venetian glass beads were used like in um, the Congo um, mm-hmm. as part of their their sculpture work. You know, like they would get Venetian glass and then they would use it. They would use it in the Congo. Um, they would take, um, you know, gold from Africa. And a lot of that gold would end up in like the gold leaf um, on um, on Italian paintings, like the Italian masters paintings that the gold that is leafed into um, those paintings and um, in the, the frames that went around those paintings, a lot of that gold came out of Africa. Yeah. Um, a lot of the um, carve work, um, the uh, religious iconography that were, um, uh, ivory carvings and, and things like that of the Virgin Mary, of um, uh, the Holy Family and stuff like that. Those were commissioned by a lot of you, like wealthy European families. They would commission African artists to do it. And so African artists would use ivory and carve these things and then send them up to, to Europe. So there was this incredible symbiotic relationship they had good relations diplomatically they had good relations um you know trade wise you know business relations um and so that was not something that i knew ever or understood ever in my understanding of um you know when i thought about africa and when i thought about europe because the story that i had heard my whole life growing up was that when Europeans came to Africa, they found nothing, yeah. that the people had nothing. It was, you know, a dark continent. The people were savage. Um, I, it was never a part of my education that no, they under, they had very good relationships. Um, they understood each other as, you know, equal cultures, um, and they had a very symbiotic relationship as well prior to um, uh, colonialization. So that that was a big reveal for me. Yeah, yeah, and and I think that it could, even putting uh, like that like history that's like ordered that has produced great things. Uh, up against post-colonial histories of Africa or a post-colonial like understanding of Africa where it's just a totally exploited and decimated uh, like group of peoples, I guess, that, if that makes sense. I think that that actually shows the really, really horrendous nature of colonialism, that it could destroy all of this stuff, right? And, like, and actually, plunder you know the museums in in europe that are just filled with these amazing uh gifts to the world like african right. and, like people who pay yeah too. yeah and so I, I think that um well i'd be interested to hear which of these people did you have the most fun researching 
Which one's kind of the most like surprising? I know I was all um, kind of the pain. I mean, yeah, there's uh, there's definitely a lot. It's hard to choose one, but the yeah. one that I think had like the the funnest story for me was Aman Arenas, who was the um, the Kandake of Kush. Kandake is the the word that means queen. Um, I also loved finding out that Kandake, um, because it can be spelled with either K or C. Um, and when it's spelled with C, it looks like Candace, and that actually is where the name Candace comes from. No, I didn't know that. Oh, um, yeah. yeah, I was like, ooh, that's really cool, because I know a couple of Candaces, and that's kind of cool. Um, so her, the whole thing about Amon Arenas was that she was a contemporary of Cleopatra. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows Cleopatra. There have been, you know, many books, many movies, <laughs> all kinds of things like, you know, dolls, right? Her daughter had a doll based on Cleopatra. Um, but Amon Arenas was a contemporary of Cleopatra, lived at the same time, and was literally Cleopatra's neighbor to the south. And so she was the con uh, the Kandake of Kush. And after there she is, uh, the one eyed, um, the one eyed Kandake, they called her. Yes. Um, because she didn't lose her eye in battle. Um, after um, Caesar Augustus conquered Egypt and Egypt became Roman Egypt and Cleopatra died, um, uh, he was looking south because there were more resources uh, to be conquered out of Kush. Uh, Egypt didn't have as many trees and so a lot of the lumber that was used in Egypt came out of Kush. And so he was looking to um, to access that and also access, um, you know, more of the minerals. So iron, gold, etc. cetera. And uh, Amon Arenas and her husband, Teratekas, they, knew, I mean, obviously they knew what was happening in Rome. They knew about, you know, things being conquered, they knew about the death of Cleopatra, they, you know, they could not have not known because they were, you know, right there. And um, before Rome uh, decided to come in to their country, they sort of rode out to, um, to, to take uh, Rome to go toe to toe and not to conquer Egypt or conquer Egypt, Rome, Roman Egypt at all, but just really to maintain their borders. And so there was a lot of back and forth in that um in that relationship because you know Rome definitely wanted to come in and and um Amon Arenas definitely just wanted to keep them out she just wanted to keep her country fine she was not looking to conquer or anything like that she just wanted her country to be her country and in one of those uh, one time when uh Amon Arenas had defeated the Roman soldiers she took a lot of the statues that they were making and one of them was this bust of Caesar Augustus and she had it buried under one of her temples where people would be walking up and down every day so that, you know, so like this, haha, I walk on your head every day, like everybody's walking on your head. Um, and I found that to be really funny. But the funniest part was after they went clashing back and forth and back and forth, and they really could not break through Amon Arenas's, um uh, army. I mean, they, they had made their way into Kush. Um, uh, so, you know, there were definitely Romans in Kush, but they still, like, they really couldn't defeat her. Um, you know, Teratekas, her husband, died in, in a, a, a battle. Her husband, um, her son, Akinadad, he also died in battle. She lost her eye in one of those battles, and still they could not defeat her. So they eventually decided that they would go for diplomacy. And so she sent a delegation um, up to Rome. And with this delegation, she sent um, a sheaf of golden arrows. And the delegation were told um, to offer them to Caesar and say, um, if you are our friend, um, please accept these arrows as a token of our friendship. Um, but if you are not our friend, you should keep them anyway because you're going to need it. Um, <laughs> it was just, oh my gosh, like what a boss move. It is it is the greatest story. I love it so much. I can't, I can't even. It was so much fun and juicy to find that story. And again, it was one of those stories where 
it was not written down. So this again was like relegated to legend. But as we know, the Jaili and the Grio, their job was to hold these legends orally. Um, yeah. You know, so I feel like, you know, it has been repeated enough that I, you know, I consider it to be um, historical fact. And besides, well, I love it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and so I guess like this is when, when I was reading this, and, and maybe this would be a good place to kind of end. And then I guess I'll, I'll remind the audience too, if you have any questions uh, that you'd want uh, us to answer on, on anything, any topic, I guess, uh, preferably the book, but <laughs> like where, where you want to eat, uh, is that like each one of these characters, and then just a general idea is, or contains the amount of information that like, you know, could fill one book, several books. And so, I imagine the editing and like curatorial process for like what you included one of staying out was pretty intense for like the research that you were doing. So uh, if you can kind of talk us through that aspect of things. Too. Sure. I, the yeah. thing is, you would think that that's the case, but it yeah. isn't only because there's so much information missing. Yeah. Um, so Meroitic script, which is uh, the language of the Kushites, has not been deciphered mm -hmm. um, the way that Egyptian hieroglyphics have, because we have the Rosetta Stone, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. enabled us to translate your um, Egyptian hieroglyph. Mm -hmm. But Meroitic script, we have all of their writing, a whole bunch of their writing, but we don't have a Rosetta Stone that helps us to translate it. So there is this wealth of stories that's sitting there that's that's written in stone. So like it's gonna be there for a while. Um, but we don't have the information because we don't know how to translate it. It is driving me insane. Um, okay. Well, I'm sure there's like, well, is there a whole industry like based on just trying to translate? I mean, I mean imagine like, the knowledge. I feel like there's like a guy. <laughs> it's like one poor soul it's like really trying to do this i'm sort of hoping that like this could be like a really good use of um artificial intelligence um oh, to be able to like like work on this project like that's something i would I'd, I'd really love to see somebody do but yeah there's really not a lot of people again because it's not considered um to be something that's like worthy you know like historically there's not a lot of people working on this. Um, and so, you know, it's still sitting there. But, I, you know, the reason, I mean, the book is not yeah. chonky. It's not a chonky book. Yeah. And the reason that it's not a chonky book is because there's a lot of information that I just couldn't find. Yeah. Um, so when I was writing these stories, I really just like scraped through and got as much information as I could that could tell a good story. And of course, yes, there's a lot of stuff that's left out because there are some details that just don't kind of fit nicely into the narrative that yeah. I told. But I really try used as much of the information uh, that I could get as, as I possibly could. And I think that I am sure, actually, not just think, but I am sure that somebody who's a better researcher than me can probably go in and dig more and, and get a little bit more out of these stories. But there still is just not a lot there because it hasn't been, there hasn't been a lot of people focused on these people and the things that happened to them to have enough information um, to tell the stories. And that, that's also why in between the stories, there are these little interstitial pieces that talk about you know, the finding of metal in the ground and, and, you know, like, you know, what was happening in the land, because a lot of that had to do with, you know, how the societies came together and why they came together the way that they did. Um, so I read a lot of, um, like, art, like, very dry archaeological reports about um, mining metals and, um, you know, like the various practices of, you know, like how people um, uh, went searching for gold and sort of like the the um, sort of r relations between like who could search for gold, like in some societies, only men could touch the gold. In some societies, they were like, everybody could touch the gold. Like, what are you talking about? Like, we need all hands on deck. Like, you know, why are you making these distinctions? So uh, there were a lot of these very dry archaeological things that I read through to sort of understand 
all of that. And I think it would take somebody who was able, um, uh, you know, and, and maybe more skilled at me at research to like go through all of those things to like, you know, parse out a lot of more details. Because there were times when I would read like a whole like 22 page archaeological report. And out of that, I would get like one sentence that related to the story. Um, you know, so it's it's a daunting task to go through. But a lot of the notes from my editor were like, can you find out more about this? Is yeah. there more information about that? Like, is does this person have a name? <laughs> you know, there are a lot of questions like that that would like, I'd be like, I, I promise you, I'm giving you everything I have, I promise. Um, so yeah, it, it was not, it was, there was not a, the situation of like having to leave out so much. A lot of the things I left out were more of the sort of technical stuff and less of the story stuff. So I really want, um, you know, somebody to, to dig in into the stories more and find out more information. I really wish there was more on them mm -hmm. that I could have provided because um, just imagine what Amon Arenas was like, you know, like on a regular day, like, <laughs> I mean, she's hysterical. So like, I really want to know more about her and there just wasn't a lot um, that I could find. It was a real disappointment because I mean, like, I really, like I, I, the women in particular, like really impressed me with their forward yeah. thinking. I was just like, yeah. how did you know to do that? Like, that's amazing, yeah. you know? Um, well, and even like the, the rulers, like the, uh, like the male like conquerors, right? If we just think of them in, as in the traditional context of like ancient civilization, like conquerors, like the, even those feats, seems similar to me as uh like the ancient phoenicians right or or uh um the assyrians right they were just kind of right. copying these other so uh i feel well what i what i hope the future of this book is right is that there's some uh precocious uh, 10 or 11 year old that decides that okay this is what i'm gonna do with my life i'm gonna try and figure out what the kushites were writing right? yes. and, and i feel like that can be a really awesome i yeah I definitely make a call for that in the in the book. Yeah. I'm like, please, please, you know, tiny human, <laughs> please grow up and like figure this out for us. Because yeah. like, I really want to know. Like, yeah. I really want to know. So, or I mean, like, how's I think it's the same. If there's someone reading about Cleopatra or Alexander the Great, it's like, oh, ancient Greece seems really cool. I want to study that for like or ancient Egypt, ancient China. Uh, and so I feel like you've given us uh, a really valuable piece of literature. No, oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I really hope it's like a jumping off point, as you say, for, yeah. for you know, like some 10 year old uh, to be like, ooh, I'm gonna make like ancient Kush my life. And I'm gonna <laughs> be like, yes, here for it, honey. Do yeah. it, do yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so, okay, I mean, I have a few other questions, if, uh, or at least there's one more that I'm kind of dying to ask that might have a quick answer. Uh, and then maybe we can call it if knowing the audience has questions. Sure. Um, but I'm wondering if like who got left out? Was there, oh, someone, um, was there like an 11th person that you like? Yeah, tried? there was an 11th person and it <laughs> was um, Prince Alameyu who was an Ethiopian prince. And there are two reasons he got left out. One was because it really was past the sort of uh, beginning of the colonial period. Mm -hmm. um, so Ethiopia was the only country that was never colonized in, in Africa and had a lot to do with his parents. Um, his dad was just like, no, <laughs> it's just not gonna happen. Um, and was really somebody who fought back, um, you know, really well. Um, so, so there was that, but also he was very, very young at the time of the uh, sort of significant events um, surrounding um, the British invasion of Ethiopia and um, all of the things that happened there. And then he was as a toddler um, or, you know, sort of maybe, maybe just past toddler, um, but still very, very young, taken to, um, to Britain. Um, and he, that's where he grew up. And he sort of became this kind of pet of the queen 
where she like sort of liked him um, and he like, you know, like had sort of privileges and he would like come around the, you know, court and, and whatnot and sort of, you know, be this thing that people could look at. Yeah. Um, and he, he had this very miserable life and he, he really wanted to go back to Ethiopia and, and kept asking because, but, you know, I mean, obviously he was a child, um, but he kept asking to go back to Ethiopia. And, you know, both his parents were, were dead before he even left um, the African continent. Um, both his parents had died um, and he was just not allowed to go back. And he died at age 18 um, of pleurisy which is a disease that is, you know, immensely curable um, and is something that people used to call a, a poor person's disease. So here is a prince who is, you know, favored by a British queen um, dying of what they considered a poor person's disease. Um, and then he's buried, um, you know, in, uh, uh, I can't remember if he's in, um, he's in one of the castles, I can't remember where, um, and they will not return his remains to Ethiopia. So, you know, it was, he didn't have a lot of agency in his story, not like the other um, uh, people that we, that are, you know, the, the icons, um, you know, and his life was really just awful. It was really just miserable. And we just did not want that to be like the last, <laughs> the last one to end on. But also it was also a little bit past the time period that we wanted to stick to. So, so there were a couple of reasons that we left him out. But, yeah, uh, and I mean, it seems horrible in uh, in a way that's familiar to, to us. Yes. Right? yes. Right. And I guess when I was, thinking, I was thinking, wasn't uh, like Pushkin's father wasn't he like a court uh, was stolen from Africa and was yeah 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 yep. also yep. Yeah, there, I mean, there was definitely a lot of that. I think they recently, because um, when his father died, um, Alamehu's father, one of the British soldiers like cut off his father's hair and took it um, with them as a prize. And I think that was only recently returned, like maybe in the last, within the last three or four years I'm talking about, it was returned. So yeah. really recently, um, but they still will not exhume Alameyu's body to determine, you know, like if the remains that are there are actually his and to return them, to re repatriate those remains to the um, Ethiopian people. They, they just basically refused to do it. Like literally Queen Elizabeth recently was just like, no. Yeah. Which is like, what? <laughs> yeah, that's a thing that just happened. Yeah, and so I mean, this this history is still so dynamic, right? Like, it, like, of course, like what we're still like learning, but then also the things that we think that we know, but we can't really pin down, right? For for different uh, kind of stubborn, stubborn folks, uh, mostly right. British, I guess. <laughs> so, like, yes, you know, like, yes, the empire was quite yeah. a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, well, that's uh, that's that's all I got. Thank you so much. This was great. This was amazing. So fun. And I did, I feel like I learned a lot from reading this book too, even having some like basic understanding of like the history. And so I, like I was grateful for this too. Thank you. Thank you so much. A little nephew that should have it. Yay. So we can throw it back to, hey, hey. Um. Empire, empire ruining everything is a is always a good place to to wrap up. <laughs> a good mic drop. Um, yeah, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation and Tracy for this wonderful book. I do think it's you know it's a great one to read with your kids again because you'll learn as much as your kids do. Um, so we want to encourage folks to click this teal button at the bottom center of your screen to buy it for yourself, buy it for a friend, a young person in your life, or you know for your child's school library because um, you know this is a great gift to donate to a library in honor of a teacher. Um, especially this month, you know, that's a really nice, don't wait till the end of the school year to make a gift in a, you know, when they're inundated with coffee mugs, you know, do it now. Um, it's always a good time to appreciate teachers. So this is a really good thing to donate to a library in a teacher's name. Um, 
things like that, you know, because we really want to get this book, you know, into the hands of young people and really in institutional settings so that um, this history, as folks have mentioned in the chat, like that, that the history isn't just starting with slavery in the United States, right? The kids see this history from the very beginning. So um, thank you both very much for being with us on this Saturday. I hope you enjoy the rest of the beautiful weather um, and uh, that we'll get to see you uh, in, the, in the future, hopefully maybe in person. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, well, take, take good care. Thank you so much. And thanks right. to Auburn. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Ye